have always been fascinated by steam engines and steam became very much a way of life. There was always this fascination with railways and trains and engineering. If my railway with a, a wave of a magic wand could become the Lincoln Barnstable and one could turn back the clock and just buy all the bits and pieces, which after all were sold very, very cheaply, and, and just somehow bring the Lincoln Barnstable back to life. Travelling in a steam train is like being pulled along by a horse. It's as if it's alive. It snorts. You can feel it pulling. The rattle of the wheels is like the clicking of the hooves, and your seat sways around underneath you. The sensation's strongest on the small-scale narrow-gauge railways, run mostly these days for holidaymakers, like this one in the Brecon Beacons. And the smaller and quainter they are, the more we enjoy the ride. Well, some of us do. Fifty years ago, narrow-gauge railways were being sold for scrap. Now they're being searched out and put back to work, some by companies, some by railway societies. Any tickets, please? And a few by determined individuals. This tiny railway has been rebuilt from scratch at Launceston in Cornwall by Nigel Bowman and his wife, not Lillian, but Kay. Narragate railways were fascinating to me because of the equipment that they used always looked a little bit quainter and a little bit odder than the main lines. And Narragate wound off into the country, it went up mountains, it, it went through valleys, it went round sharp corners and up steep gradients. And that blending of the countryside and railways is to me very attractive. I had gone to North Wales and stumbled across Penryn Slate quarries. Although it was closed, there were a few engines still for sale. And when I found that one of the engines was available for only 60 pounds, that was just too good to miss. I rebuilt her between 1964 and 1968, and then she was doing nothing for years and years until we got the railway off the ground in 1983. Since then, she's done about 12,000 miles, and this winter we shall be giving her a big overhaul. My career was school teaching, and with a railway engine which needs a lot of work doing on it to get it into good working order, then any career really pales into insignificance. Nigel Bowman's railway is the result of 10 years hard work. It's the realization of his personal dream, inspired by one of the best loved and most sadly missed narrow gauge railways of the past, the Linton and Barnstable in North Devon, which closed in 1935. I think the Linton and Barnstable Railway is very evocative in as much as it's remembered by old illustrations, sepia photographs, snips of silly film which people took just before it closed. And we all look back at those illustrations of it and the memories of it. And, and it's very clear that it was such a, a fine railway, but it does, in a way, it, it, it's an inspiration to people who are running narrow gauge railways. A wealthy Victorian publisher, Sir George Nunes, who'd built a large house at Linton, was the impetus behind the line. It opened in 1898 to much local rejoicing. The little trains had to work hard on the difficult route between Linton and Barnstable, but justified Sir George's faith in narrow-gauge railways. We'd look back now on the Linton and Barnstable as something very quaint, but in its day it was a real leader. The locomotives that it used were, were quite the most modern, but were available then and everything about the line was extremely well done. The whole railway was very much a main line in miniature. I think the special thing about the Linton is it was very much its own railway. It was built by local people for local people. It was built as a tourist project to carry people to Linton, and, and it did that in a very charming and picturesque way through beautiful countryside. But at the same time, it was a real railway. It connected with the main line, and it had a real role to play. The line closed in 1935, not because it didn't prove itself, it simply fell victim to the motor car. A wreath was laid on the stop block at Barnstable Station. The inscription, to Barnstable and Linton Railway with regret and sorrow from a constant user and admirer. Perchance it is not dead, but sleepeth. It was a sad day, but what a brave face they put on it. You'd have thought it was their first day at work, rather their last. That young man squatting by the wreath was Fred Kidwell, a fitter at the Pilton Depot in Barnstable. This was the carriage sheds <coughs> back in the old days. Yes. And that was the good shed. I see. For the office. Yes. And that was 1925. <coughs> 
Yes, and before. Yeah. And this was all carriage, head stone. Yeah, right 51 years after yeah. that photograph, right Fred Kidwell went yeah. back to his workplace the for the first time since the line closed and the rails were ripped up. Talking with the present owner, that yard was suddenly all bustle again. And the lines came round. We used to have the good roads up through here. No cliff trucks at the main depot in those days. They employed over 30 men here. It was really the freight that provided the line's bread and butter, right to the end, until road transport took the trade. What wouldn't enthusiasts give, though, to put that neat little railway train back on its tracks? It was at the Pilton Depot that they were kept and serviced. I was 16 when I started here in July 1925. Cleaning engines, that was my first job of cleaning. 28 shillings in the July when I started. I had a birthday in December, and I went up to 32 shillings. If you was working on a railway, you were sure of a job. And that was the, the main thing that you had to worry about, wasn't it? Back in those days, was getting a job and keeping it. Well, out there, there was two pits where the engines used to come in uh, to be serviced, to clean the fires, do the axle, the ash pan, yeah. and the smoke box door. And the ash used to go in the pit there? Oh, you're in the pit. <clears throat> and that's where the examination used to take place. Yeah. <clears throat> then There's it used them. to run into the, the shed. Is that the mark there where <clears throat> the lines used to? <clears throat> this is the actual gauge, which was my father's, because he was the ganger on this length of railway. It's very narrow. <clears throat> One foot, 11 and a half. <clears throat> uh, this was the shed's where the engines were stored during the night. And you could see where the chutes were, right down through, where the chimneys used to be right opposite. To it's take, quite hard, to take all the, take all the, the beams smoke. are still sooty, half a century since an engine stood there. There were five of them in all, named after West Country rivers, X, Lynn, Yo, Tor, and Lou. Their careers came to an end on the 29th of September, 1935. It was all such a shock when it happened. I was in that engine shed that morning, and the governor came in from Exmouth Junction. He said, good morning, lads. Well, I've come to close you up. And that was it. Within a few weeks, the entire railway had been auctioned off, to scrap merchants mainly. It was like the breakup of a marriage with outsiders picking over the family treasures. The pain of it, to see lot numbers slapped on all that lovingly polished brass and paintwork including 16 and three quarter miles of track, signal and telegraph apparatus, five tank locomotives, 17 eight-wheel passenger carriages, 19 open goods wagons, 10 covered goods wagons, three eight-ton goods brake vans, plate layers trolleys, turntable, portable cranes, weighbridge, repair... Lot 13, a 242 outside side tank locomotive, Lynn, number 762 by Baldwin's Loco Works, USA. Total weight, working order, 22 tonnes. Spares, eight tyres, nine springs, 16 mouthpiece protectors and four brass bearings. Sold for £50. Unlucky 13. In a few days, Lynn and three of her sisters were dismembered. Just over £50 apiece, that's all. I think all of us who are involved in our age, if we could just turn the clock back and rescue some of the stuff from that auction. Certainly the, the rolling stock, when it was sold, wasn't run down. It wasn't dilapidated. It was in perfect condition. It was a railway uh, in tip-top shape, ready to run. And what was it sold for? It was sold for summer houses, for chicken sheds, uh, for garden shelters. And these superb carriages were just left out to moulder. The signal box went, but one of the locomotives escaped the blowtorch. That was Lou, knocked down to work for a coffee plantation in Brazil. No more was heard of her, and some say she's still there. Three carriages survived. One was burnt in the 1960s, another's on a preserved railway line altered out of all recognition. But this one spent 50 years in the garden of a rectory. 
If only that coach full of clerics had prayed a little harder and a little earlier. For his few pounds, the rector got a first-class observation saloon, a third-class compartment, a guard's van and a dog box. But, praise be, it was saved and wait to be restored in the York Railway Museum. It would take thousands just to return the first-class saloon to its former glory. It's a classic example of Victorian coach building before Formica replaced mahogany and air conditioning took over the job of a leather strap to let the window down. Andrew Dow helped to organise its rescue in 1982. He made a sentimental journey to York with Stanhope Baker, who half a century before had spent a happy summer holiday riding the Linton Line. You know, it was over 50 years you last travelled on the Linton Vast, wasn't it? Yes, it was. It was in uh, the last months of its life, 1935. And I actually travelled in this coach once, I remember. Yes. 1898 it was built. Yes, yes. In uh, yeah. Lawrence Hill in Bristol. Mm. In a Bristol carriage and... No, I must get the name right. The Bristol Wagon and Carriage Works Company Limited. In fact, there's a little plate up there. It's still there, is it? Yes, oh, indeed it okay. is. The common thinking is that these coaches were the best available on narrow gauge. They must have been quite high class, I would think, yes. It's all scaled down mainline stuff, isn't it, really? The luggage racks and even the photographs above the seats there. And when it's restored, expensively, I don't doubt, it really will be a lovely oh, coach. Yes. And the sideways seating allows the passengers to look out straight ahead of him, as it were, oh. instead of as an angle. Well, sitting here, it brings it back to me. Amazingly. Does it? Oh, indeed, yes. Yes. You can feel it sway beneath your feet, can you? <laughs> yes, it did rattle a little bit when I was uh, travelling in it on that short distance because it was the last coach in the train and yes. it wagged a little bit, but uh, not bad, not very pleasant. Yes. And a beautiful view. The view is still much the same, but could any part of this line ever be restored, really? Most of it's vanished into the landscape. Here at Chelfham, though, you can see that once there was a railway. Chelfham Viaduct had been the costliest structure on the line to build. It took over a quarter of a million bricks. It's already listed as an ancient monument, though British Rail would no doubt gladly sell it off to anyone prepared to keep it up. Today, there would be plenty of buyers for the whole line. Our misfortune was that the Linton goes down too early. If only... Oh, well. I think there's no doubt that if the line had somehow survived the war years until, say, the early 1950s, it would still be with us today. The fact is, though, that ever since the wreath laid on its grave, its ghost has haunted the enthusiasts. Could we ever see a locomotive rescued from the Brazilian jungle chuffing along any part of a revived Linton to Barnstable railway line? Could the spirit of Sir George Nunes wave his checkbook over the old station inn and transform it back into Blackmore Gate Station? Perchance it is not dead, but sleepeth. It isn't impossible to find the old wayside platforms where only rattling milk churns and an approaching train disturb the peace. They're still there, drowning under willow herb and bracken, but now Woody Bay Station is just a cottage in a wood. It almost came back to life in the early 70s when Nigel Bowman was searching for somewhere to start his railway. The first place we looked, obviously, was the legendary Linton and Barnstable line. In places, you could have virtually cut down the trees and laid the track. It was intact. But any line which has been closed for a number of years, little bits have been sold off. And although there were short stretches which could have had a railway put on them, it would have been extremely difficult to buy back all pieces of land and to have persuaded the highways authority that they'd really got to undo their road improvements and put the railway back. We looked long and hard at the Linton and Barnstable and eventually, and very sadly, decided that we couldn't do anything economically on the site, although we, we could quite see that it, it would be possible. But not everybody took the same view. 
Linton was Bill Pryor's favourite station and his favourite bit of railway history. He bought it and at once set about living his own legend. Mr and Mrs Essery were once regular passengers here. Bill Pryor loves to swap stories with people who knew the line. Yeah. Train used to go through the middle of the Okay. Yeah. They are. This used to be the office of the station. Yeah. Master. That's right. Yeah. Yeah, and then the waiting yeah. room. No. Oh yes, yeah, Linton Limerick. Yeah. Oh, look at that. that. Yeah. Isn't that beautiful. Yeah. Get up there. Yeah. Nineteen yeah. eleven. Yeah. That's four miles down. We'll yeah. catch that one next week. That's it. Yeah. We'll get that one yeah. next week, shall we? Yeah. Do you remember the old bookstall in there? Oh yes. Yeah, W.H. Smith. Yeah. That's where you used to come and pick up the papers mornings. No. We don't want them on here. Because they're too big. <laughs> we would still prefer to have our little one. That that was yeah. the ticket office. Yeah. Uh, which is yeah. now the bathroom yeah. of the house. All right. mm -hmm. That's the old Edward the mm. Seventh box. Yeah. Didn't I didn't remember each of them. I do. I remember that one. Yes, yeah, quite easy. Yeah. Quite easy. Yes. Yeah. It's uh, beautiful to be up here though now again yeah. to see. Of course, you wonder what I've been up to here then. You know. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> it is lovely to see something yeah. being yeah, used up. Yeah, the oh, waiting room. That's the waiting room. Good, lovely. Black stove oh, in the middle. General yeah. room, isn't it? Yeah. Lovely. Yeah. Isn't it really yeah. beautiful? Yeah. To see yeah. it all so nice again. Yeah. Lovely. It's good. Touch it back to well, what yeah. it was. When we go out the other side, well, then there was um, the Limith and Linton. Linton and Limith place. A big sign. Yeah, the big sign. That was on the, the other museum. platform, yes. And down where the Laurels be used to be the signal box. That's it. And up over was the water tank. That's it. And the engine yes, shades. That's, that's right. It, yeah. Oh, the engine shades under highways. That's it. Yeah. They had uh, two platforms here, one for the one passenger in general, and then one they used to shunt along the odd bits and pieces, yes. uh, waiting to be hooked up to the back of the general. And you think you could sit on. But it's all gone. All gone, yeah. Maybe, for now, anyway. Bill Pryor can't accept that it'll be forever. Hopefully, maybe in the distant future, a, a section of the old line will be reopened as a tourist attraction. It would do extremely well. It would bring a lot of wealth to the area and try to recreate the most famous narrow gauge railway. This is how the track looked just north of Bratton Fleming in the 1930s. Two bends and one of the 80 bridges on the climb to Linton. It has changed a bit. It may be a little overgrown, but it is a railway again. David Moore is someone else with a grand obsession about something he never really knew. He owns about half a mile of the track bed, and on it he's busy building his own Linton and Barnstable railway. The gauge of his track is just seven and a quarter inches, about a third of the original. The engine, Bratton, he built himself. The track he also laid. His reward is to stoke up his imagination until he's at the controls of one of Linton's tough little tank engines, pounding up the bank to Blackmore Gate. David spends most weekends like this, it's a satisfying feeling to be on the footplate of your own engine, even though it's a bit cramped. He has no plans to tap the tourist market. This is a purely private world. Playing trains? Certainly. But Bratton is no toy. At half a ton, it can pull eight times its own weight. David Moore's next locomotive will be even more powerful, a scaled-down miniature of Tor, an original Linton engine. For some, this would never be enough. The urge to rebuild the railway as it was is too strong. It must be the original one foot, 11 and a half inch gauge carrying tourists again. At Lanky near Barnstable, hidden under scrapped symbols of what put them out of business in the first place, are some more enduring items of railway hardware. This is the base of the Linton and Barnstable Railway Association, 
It's run by Clarence de la Cote. The main aim of the society is to open so much of the old LMB railway um, as we possibly can. Um, we'll never open all of it, obviously. Um, but we're mainly concerned um, with a small section, possibly two to three miles. We've got a, a locomotive. We've got 10 railway wagons of our own. We've got sections of the old LMB carriages. A lot of equipment, a lot of rail, a lot of sleepers. We're very confident. We'll get a section reopened in the next two years. It will be the main tourist attraction for the Barnesville area. It may seem far-fetched, but it's already been done elsewhere. If one was going to look around for a line to say this line is, is being done in the same way that the Linton and Barnstable was, one would certainly look at Brecon Mountain Railway and put it probably at the top of the list because it uses very substantial track, very heavy rails, very well laid, and the rolling stock in many ways is not dissimilar and everything about the Brecon Railway has been done to achieve the best the station facilities in particular and I think one would draw a parallel there with the Linton and Barnstable Railway which in its day was certainly at the forefront of railway technology The Brecon Mountain Line is one of the great little trains of Wales Every year it delights 40,000 passengers, yet only 10 years ago it is a wilderness, just like the Linton and Barnstable. All it needed was vision, money and ability. Three things possessed by Tony Hills. What cost compared to fish plating joints, any idea? Well, they say it's £40 a joint, you see. As much as that? Tony Hills discovered the route of the old Brecon and Merthyr Railway. Right, right, right. Uh, he discovered that at about the same time that I discovered a section of the North Cornwall Railway. And being a practical engineering sort of chap, it's no wonder that he started a railway in much the same way that we have in Cornwall. Tony, she's enormous. She must be the biggest narrow-gauge engine in this country. Well, as far as I know, she's the biggest two-foot gauge loco ever built. Um, there were quite a few built of this type for the South African railways. But um, it weighs 61 ton with coal and water on. And you've recently brought back from South Africa? That's right, yes. It's been here since March, and um, <clears throat> we hope to have her running before too long. But, of course, we've got to strip, strip all the lagging off. The yeah. boiler's got to be inspected. We've got to get a boiler certificate. One of the problems about railways of, of about two-foot gauge is shortage of equipment. Twenty years ago, stuff was available in England mostly with an industrial background, that source of supply quite suddenly dried up. And not surprisingly, people started looking overseas and Tony Hills has taken the bull by the horns and imported a large South African Bayer Garrett locomotive, which is now on the Brecon Railway. But when we started on this, Tony, stuff was comparatively cheap, wasn't it? I paid £60 pounds for an engine for the Welsh Lake Quarry. That's right, those were the days, weren't they? That's right. <laughs> yeah, we... The Sybil here, um, I bought that in 1963 and I think I paid 80 pounds for it or something. I mean, it was a bit of a state then, mind you. Good investment. <laughs> I suppose so. But what, but are I we, mean, what are we talking about today for a, a, even a small working steam locomotive in fair condition for a narrow gauge railway? Well, the thing is that you say in working condition. Well, I suppose in that case, you're talking of perhaps 10,000 pounds. Exactly. <clears throat> so uh, a wreck you might get for 5,000. So the costs are high, but then for Nigel Bowman, the rewards are great. So many of your senses are stirred by a steam engine. You can smell it, you can hear it, you can see it. And it's very much alive, even when it's not moving, there's something going on. It's warm, it makes a, a sort of crackling noise as, as water drops onto hot surfaces. There's a smell of, of warm oil. There's something very magical about it. It's an incredibly straightforward, simple machine. And because it's so straightforward and simple, it's, it's also beautiful. It's made of straightforward materials, brass and cast iron and steel, and, and yet crudely fitted together. This very crude machine can work so well and achieve so much. To the new generation, born into a high-tech world, steam trains are a mystery. They look at a steam engine for the first time, and it looks very large, and it's, it's an awe-inspiring object. 
and they step back. And perhaps they're a little bit frightened, but then gradually they, they edge closer and closer. And within half an hour, they don't want to leave it. And I'm sure that they go away from these little tourist railways and all they want to do is to come back or go to another one. And that's it, they're hooked. There's a lot of parallels with looking at the tourists getting onto the train at Pant Station on the Brecon Mountain Railway. You can just imagine that was really not so very different from tourists getting onto the train at Linton Station, embarking on a journey. And as the train winds off round the corner, you get a glimpse of what promises to be a very attractive journey through beautiful countryside behind a steam engine. And that's really not so very different, I would have thought, from the emotions that a tourist would have experienced with a ride on the Linton and Barnstable Railway, maybe 50, 60, 70s ago. The differences are, of course, that the Brecon Railway, as with so many today, the recreation of what the Linton and Barnstable was all about. It, it, it's a recreation, in a way it's a caricature, but it's an extremely accurate one. It's no mock-up using artificial equipment. Uh, it's, it's no amusement park thing. Everything about it is real. The locomotives are real, the rolling stock is real, the track bed itself has got a history, and when it comes to it, even the rails have got a history. But it's been assembled together to make a recreation of something that was there before. I think the man behind the Linton and Barnstable Railway, Sir George Newnes, would, if he's looking down on the Brecon, feel a great rapport with it. I'm sure he'd be saying to himself, well, there we are, my ideas were absolutely right. The narrow gauge railway in beautiful countryside is what people want. There's something about the railway. It's an era which has, has vanished. We're looking back to the days when people went on holiday, not by car, but by train. And I think a lot of us, of course, still remember that. But even those who don't still capture a magic from the railway. And the number of people who are interested, the number of holiday makers who ride on preserved railways is, is a testimony to the fact that Sir George Newnes was absolutely right. <laughs> <laughs> 